Hello and welcome to another episode of the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Joining me today on this sunny Wednesday afternoon is Associate Editor Joel Stocksdale. Hey everybody. How's it going? Pretty good. Good, good. And on the phones from Columbus, Ohio, Consumer Editor Jeremy Korsniewski. What's up, man? Hey buddy, how's it going? We are uh, doing pretty well, doing pretty well. We got a great show for you today. We're going to talk about the Porsche Cayenne. Uh, literally, I just drove that into the office today. Joel drove the Hyundai Veloster N. Uh, that's the uh, high performance, high spec version. Nissan, and then Jeremy, you spent some time in the Nissan Armada, which is a car that frankly isn't coming through the press fleets very much. Uh, so I will be interested to hear your take on that. Uh, it's been a while since I've driven one of those. Uh, then we're going to talk about Joel's uh, experience at Goodwood, the Festival of Speed. Uh, lots of cool things happen there. Uh, I have never been. So, Joel, you're going to have to really give us uh, give us a rundown of what it was like. Got some news items, Tesla, Ford, uh, some other stuff going on in the car world. Plus, we will spend your money. So let's jump right in. The, uh, the Porsche Cayenne S is uh, what I drove into the office this morning, had it last night. It's, uh, you know handsome crossover uh this had the 2.9 liter engine which is a lot of fun uh this one was not uh not cheap let's put it that way came in at over well just under 100,000 98,500 dollars uh 434 horsepower 406 pound feet of torque uh so plenty of capability here the interior uh was an area that I actually kind of found to be so simple that it was almost lacking. It was just so like, you know, the era of austerity in there just kept kind of ringing in my head. I like the infotainment system. It's, it's wide. It's fairly easy to use. Um, but, you know, in general, it was the Cayenne, specifically the Cayenne S in every way that I remembered it. Um, this one was a beautiful shade of, I would say, turquoise. I'm not sure it's a good thing, though, that when you walk out of the office, and it's sitting basically right in front of you, and I'm clicking the key fob, and I didn't see it. I mean, to me, I'm thinking the Cayenne is getting maybe a little too anonymous. I don't know. It looked gorgeous in my driveway, that's for sure. But um, yeah, I walked out of the office, then walked back downstairs trying to find it. Uh, so I don't know. I feel like right now I like the Cayenne. Uh, it's strong. It's overall, overall, it's very solid in many areas from the powertrain to the you know, the respectable design, but I think it's also getting to a stage where, you know, I think there's flashier entries. There's entries that, uh, have, you know, more decadent interiors. This one had a lot of leather inside. It was, you know, definitely ticked all the boxes, but I actually literally wrote this down in my scorecard that it seemed like the leather almost felt like plastic because it was so just like simple and like a little drab. The interior was all black. So candidly, I'm sure there's more, you know, there are flashier interior options you can choose, but I was overall just a little underwhelmed by the Cayenne. That being said, it drove great. It is a very nice SUV. It certainly creates the right image. I think steering was very good. I like how you can change the drive settings, uh, you know, with that module right sort of integrated into the steering wheel area. Uh, again, I like the infotainment. Uh, it sounded pretty good. The 2.9 liter engine is, you know, definitely got some grunt. Um, but that was my take just on my like initial first blush of driving this car. I might try to get some more seat time in it later in the week. I know both of you guys have driven the Cayenne. Uh, Jeremy, just kind of your recollections of this car and where you think it sits. Um, well, I mean, it's, I, I feel like as uh, automotive journalists, we're kind of um, beholden to this idea that we can't talk about the Cayenne without talking about Porsche's history as a uh, sports car maker. Um, I'm just going to counter that immediately by saying that um, uh, in the 15 years that uh, Porsche has been selling the Cayenne, they sold s something like 770,000 of them. Um, so they're doing something right. Uh, people seem to like this thing. Um, you know, it, it's not, it's not the direction that I would go if I wanted a, uh, a luxury sport utility vehicle. Um, it's, I think it's sportier, uh, historically sportier than, uh, your typical crossover that it might be competing with. Um, but when I look at the, um, the interior, exactly like what you were talking about, Greg, 
um, it, it does look austere. Um, and I think that they're going for that and, you know, they, they hit that mark. Um, but then I look at, um, the, uh, equivalent Mercedes and, you know, you, you pack it up with a, a Designo package and get like, uh, you, you order it that way. And the idea of plasticky leather is, uh, you know, it's the exact opposite in, in the Mercedes. Um, so yeah, if I think, I think if I was spending my own money, it's not the direction I would go, but I also get it. Um, that Porsche badge is, uh, just epically cool. Um, it's, it's such a cool thing to be able to park uh, a Porsche in your driveway, um, have it be your family car. Well, there's something to be said for that too. Um, so I get it. Um, and I think chances are it's going to continue along with the Macan, um, to really be the core of uh, Porsche's offerings here in the United States. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it does, I would say, feel special to drive. Like, you know, on the way into work, I had the windows down, was playing with the, the different settings. I was definitely enjoying myself. I think it does effectively sort of convey the real Porsche, you know, ethos into crossover form. So I think you got to give it credit for that. You know, the interesting thing is, I think the Cayenne is one of the original controversial crossovers. When they first built this, people were like, you know, ripping their hair out. What is Porsche doing? How can Porsche make a crossover? This is the company that gave us the 911 and all these other iconic cars. How could Porsche do this? Everybody has a crossover now. I mean, everybody. Rolls Royce has a crossover. Ferrari is going to do one. I mean, Lamborghini. Like, it's just so like over people obsessing about who's making crossovers and who's staying true to the roots that, you know, it doesn't matter, but it did kind of dawn on me when I was driving this thing, like, Oh yeah, this is interesting. You know, the Cayenne is one of the crossovers anyway, that sort of really sparked the true outrage and controversy about sports car brands moving away from the roots. Yeah. I, I, and I mentioned it basically, um, not because I feel like it's a problem, but more because, um, I think it's not a problem. Like it, it, it is exactly what you said, Greg. Um, it kind of kicked off this idea that premium manufacturers, uh, European brands that historically have been, you know, like Porsche, uh, they, they're sports car brand. Um, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, we all get what, the, what, what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, I think we've all accepted it. Um, and the only reason to bring it up anymore is just to say that we're over it. It doesn't even, it's not even a thing anymore. Yeah, agreed. And I think, um, you know, again, especially with the wide range of engine choices you could get in these things, I think, you know, they're really compelling choices for a lot of, you know, a lot of different, you know, people. Um, Joel, I know you did get into this one, but just general thoughts on the Cayenne, where you think it fits. Um, and, you know, yeah, general thoughts. I mean, <clears throat> I, I'm not super into it. I, and actually when I've driven it, I think it is sportier than a lot of SUVs, but I can't get past the Porsche badge on it. And every time I see it, I'm expecting it to drive even better than it does. Uh, I don't know. I feel like it's a good SUV, but maybe not necessarily a good Porsche. Uh, I don't think it really matters. But the thing is, I don't think it matters. It's clearly a huge seller for Porsche. It's going to continue to be a huge seller for Porsche, especially for people that like, they like their 911 and they want to keep driving a Porsche on a daily basis, take their family somewhere, they'll go and buy a Cayenne. Um, I'm, I'm just not into it. I actually do like the interior though. Um, I like the low dash. I like that the screen is integrated into it nicely. It's not like sticking up like a, like the, uh, what was that thing from 2001? I'm blanking on the... <laughs> Space Odyssey, I don't yeah, know, yeah. but um, yeah, it's it's a fine SUV, but it's not my thing. Um, touching on the controversy, though, it it's a it is a non-issue for me. And the key thing that I come back to is the fact that like we still have the 911, we still have the Boxster, we still have the Cayman, we still have oodles of like special versions of them. They're all spectacular to drive. It's like. I don't care if they're making SUVs and sedans on the side. Like the Porsches that we really care about are still here. 
as long as that's as long as that's still the case, they can build as many SUVs as they want. I that sums up very nicely. I think uh, let's move on to the Hyundai Veloster, which you spent a good deal of time in. Uh, you drove the um, the one with the end package, which is cool, which means this had performance. Uh, what were your what's your take on this thing and the Veloster in general? I I have some thoughts on the Veloster. I'm starting to kind of question it's necessarily it's even usefulness, but you drove this one. This is kind of the the really specked out one. What did you think? Okay. Um, well, so I look forward to finding out your <laughs> uh, questions on the vehicle, but I the Veloster N is a superb hot hatch. It is really, really good. And this is the Hyundai Veloster N with the performance package. So it has 275 horsepower and it also has the electronically controlled mechanical limited slip differential. And it's it's amazing to drive. It is so good. I I love front drive cars with limited slip diffs. I love the uh the, you get so much bite when you get on the gas through a corner. It you get all this traction and just pulls the car right through the corner. It's a lot of fun. And it feels really really neutral. It doesn't feel like a front drive car necessarily. It cuz it doesn't feel like it's super understeery. It just it just goes through the turn. No fuss, no muss. It's a really, it's an impressive car. The engine is really smooth. The power delivery is, it's not quite like a naturally aspirated car. You can still tell that there's a little bit of turboness going on, but it's so smooth and easy to control. And the shifter is really slick. The gates are really clear. Throws are a little bit longer than say like a Type R, but it's still one of the best gearboxes in the segment. It's it's an all-around great car, and it's pretty livable. It's got adjustable suspension and adjustable exhaust, so you can be quiet and comfortable when you want. You can go to ridiculously hard track suspension and like crazy loud exhaust with lots of pops and bangs. It's it's a good little car. So I think that's the case for it. My case, not necessarily against it, but for and it's a good value too. I mean, yeah. I'm not sure what this one cost, but. Yeah, the the Veloster in the regular one starts at about twenty seven thousand dollars. A solid with, deal. Yeah, and with the performance package, it's about twenty nine thousand. I mean, literally the case for it you're laying out very eloquently. My case against it would be, I think a Mustang or a Camaro or a GTI. There's other cars I would pick definitely ahead of this. Uh, at a variety of price points that are sort of in this ballpark, maybe not exactly dead on, but yeah, I mean, stuff I would consider to be more fun or perhaps more livable or more, you know, I don't know, a little more of an all around execution like the GTI, um, sort of in this price point and in this like vague performance, smaller coupe type segment. So, I mean, that would be my knock on it. Otherwise, I do enjoy driving, you know, the Veloster. I think it looks pretty good. It, um, it does some cool things. Hyundai's invested in it and they've invested in it as a performance car, which I think is cool. Um, Hyundai is really, I mean, they hired Albert Bierman from uh, BMW's M division and he's done some cool things. So, I mean, I think you're starting to see this real investment in performance pay off. So that's a good thing. I, you know, again, though, it seems like Hyundai needs to sell more and more cars this thing is, it's helping them. Sure. It's a nice image, uh, image elevator, I guess, if you will. But, um, yeah, I'm just kind of like, okay on it. I mean, I really like it. I think it's a legitimate alternative to a type R for a significant, for a significant price cut. Um, I think it's a more serious car than the GTI, uh, for me personally, it would be a little bit of a tricky decision because the GTI has a certain playfulness to it, and this Veloster N feels much more buttoned down. I, I think the I think the Veloster would be more fun on a track than the GTI. Um, and the GTI is a little bit quieter, a little bit more refined, but not not by a huge margin. Like you could absolutely live with this Veloster on a daily basis. Um, as for like Camaro and Mustang four cylinder. They definitely make a case for themselves because they have like similar power and they're also rear drive. Um, on the flip side, though, 
I I still haven't been able to convince any of my friends that like Mustangs and Camaros that a four cylinder version of one of those is legitimate. <laughs> they are every single one of them is like, oh, we got to have a V eight. There's no point in having one on the V eight. That's a really good point. I, I don't necessarily agree with them on that, and I wish the uh, I wish the opinions would shift a little bit more to accepting the small engines because V eights are expensive now. <laughs> They're expensive. They, many of them are, you know, definitely gas hogs. And, um, yeah, I mean, you could get a lot with a four cylinder Mustang or Camaro. Mm -hmm. So, so cool. Uh, I guess the opposite of the Hyundai Veloster is the Nissan, uh, Armada, I guess. I don't know on the scale of large and small things and performance, uh, not a great segue, but Hey, Jeremy, you use the Armada fittingly to move uh you moved recently to columbus uh those of you may remember jeremy he worked for a while out in seattle for us among the many places he's actually worked as an autoblog editor but uh your impressions of the armada yeah um first impression is an obvious one it is big um which is very useful when you're trying to uh, cram a bunch of stuff into the back of it uh for instance if you're moving um so yeah really helpful for something like that not as helpful as say a pickup truck might be um but uh in those chance you know those times when it starts raining well it's even better then um so thinking about or talking about its its bigness um if you start to look at uh things like the the overall length the wheelbase um and cargo capacity uh you're comparing the Armada with things like the Ford Expedition, the Chevy Tahoe, the Toyota Sequoia. Um, those are all uh, body on frame um, uh, SUVs built on uh, full size truck platforms. The Armada is a little bit different. Um, it is uh, not based on the big new uh, Titan um, that uh, um, that Nissan sells here. Uh, but it's still full size in dimensions um, and just an absolutely massive vehicle. Um, it's fine. I don't have a whole lot to say about the way that it drives. Um, no one is going to be choosing uh, a vehicle like the Armada or a Sequoia um, because it's you know it offers them sporty driving dynamics or anything else like that. Um, the the ride is pretty comfortable. Um, like I said, there's all kinds of room inside. Um, I had the chance to take some passengers with me in the car, um, pick some people up from the airport, um, and uh, everyone commented how how just if space is luxury, then the Armada is luxury, luxurious because uh, there's tons of space inside. Um, the one that I had was the platinum trim. Uh, so it was you know covered in leather, um, had high gloss wood all over it, uh, a lot of chrome. Um, I will say that I did not feel that the leather was particularly high, particularly high quality, especially when compared with um, some of its competitors that I've been in, um, the Ford Expedition being a prime uh, example. Um, it felt more durable than supple. Um, maybe that's a good thing for family vehicles. Um, why would you choose the Armada? Well, it's priced pretty well. Um, it comes in several thousand dollars less than uh, most of its competitors. Um, I'm looking at uh, just shy of $47,000 for the base price, um, which is a lot of money, um, but that is less than the Sequoia, less than the Tahoe, um, less than the expedition um i also looked at uh what the actual selling prices are and that was very interesting the armada's actual selling price is an even bigger gap um, over a lot of its competitors uh, so it seems like nissan's willing to deal on these things um, maybe not quite as much as the titan which are just the the transaction prices on those are just um, ridiculously low, like 20% below uh, MSRP. The Armada is not selling quite that that low, but um, yeah, it's still big discounts. Um, so I think if you're price shopping and uh, size is extremely important to you, the Armada offers a lot of size for a good price. Um, getting rid of the price argument, it's not what I would buy. Um, I uh, Not that long ago, we had an expedition in the office and we talked about it here in the podcast. Um, the Expedition, especially um, uh, with the three and a half liter twin turbo EcoBoost V6, um, it just feels like a better vehicle all around. 
Um, I like the way it rides better. I like the way it looks better. It feels more luxurious inside. Um, I suppose you could counter that that is um, reflected in its price. Um, they are more than $50,000 for an expedition. Um, and I would bet you that you you might see in the real world a $10,000 uh, difference between them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I liked it. Um, it's It's got good power. Uh, it's a big 5.6 liter V8 with 390 horsepower, um, four-wheel drive uh, chassis or excuse me, for a drive, uh, drivetrain, um, terrible gas mileage, as you'd expect. Um, I think the ratings are like 15, 16, something like that. Um, and I didn't do any better than that while I was driving. Um, again, the expedition with the twin turbo V6 is rated significantly higher. Um, I think it's more like 20 miles per gallon for that one. Um, but I think the elephant in the room when you're talking these full size SUVs is that crossovers are getting really big too. Um, especially in its most recent incarnation, the uh, Chevy Traverse has pretty much the same amount of space on the inside. Um, maybe not maybe not quite as much as like the Expedition Max or the Suburban as opposed to the Tahoe, uh, but comparing it with the Armada, it's not far off. Um, it weighs uh, 1,500 pounds less um, and the gas mileage is significantly better. You're not going to tow nearly as much with it, um, but you know, if that's not a consideration for you, take a look at crossovers too. Um, the starting price on a Traverse is, uh, just over $30,000. Um, and you know, for a vehicle that you're going to use to move your family, move their stuff, ride around in comfort, you're going to spend less money on a crossover. Um, and you're going to get better gas mileage and efficiency out of it too. Um, so really evaluate your needs. Um, I wouldn't not recommend the Armada. Sorry to talk in, in negatives there. Um, it wouldn't be the first vehicle off my lips if someone asked me what kind of full-size SUV they should buy. Um, but for the right buyer, uh, especially one who's uh, very strongly motivated by price, I, I do think it's a legit offering. I think that's a good point. The Armada does remain competitive on price. Uh, I think if you, you know, maybe you're like a Nissan, you know, loyalist and you, you know, you've always owned them. I could see somebody going down this road, but, um, when I sort of look at the pecking order, I like the Sequoia, even though that's quite old. I like the Tahoe. You know, the Expedition is just, I think, you know, as we discussed, basically far and away better than, you know, almost anything else in the class, I think. Uh, I mean, it is newer, so there is something to note there. But that's a great point there, Jeremy. The Chevy Traverse and some of these, you know, crossovers are just as big, and you the, you get significant advantages, fuel economy, weight, uh, but still a lot of the core functionality that you need with uh, these types of vehicles. So, so yeah, I mean, the Armada has been around for a long time. Um, yeah, let's move on to something that also has been around for a long time, and that is the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Joel, you went, was this the first time you've been? Yeah, this is my first time. All right. So what were your impressions? It was a blast. It was just fantastic. Uh, it, it's kind of it's kind of almost exactly what you want from an automotive event. Um, you've got all kinds of cool cars that are just on static display: supercars, classics, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, even the parking lot is full of cool cars because everybody's bringing out their own cool cars to Very be part cool. of this big car festival. Um, and you get to see loads of race cars and stuff, and and production cars going full tilt up the Goodwood Hill Climb course right in front of the big estate house. And it's fantastic listening to all these cars just ripping up the hill. F1 cars, uh, supercars, prototype cars, just you name it, it was out there. Um, and yeah, it it's it was just so much fun. And even some electric cars uh, may have seen that some of the big news out of Goodwood was that the 20 year standing record time that was set by a formula one car was finally broken, uh, by Volkswagen with the IDR electric race car. And I didn't see the first time it broke the record, but I did see the second time that it broke the record. Um, and even though it is an electric car, it does actually make a little bit of noise. You can hear kind of this whine as it goes past. Okay. Pretty cool. And it, the second time it went through, it did a 39.9 something second uh, time, which I think was 
not quite two seconds quicker than the than the record from 20 years ago it's pretty wild yeah and it was exciting because everybody's watching it go past and like they're watching the screens they're showing the sector times and you can kind of see that like it was on track and everybody's just kind of like all tensed up and excited and like when it finally crossed like everybody started applauding after they saw the time uh and besides like the hill climb there's also a rally course and so a bunch of vintage rally cars and you could see them running through the woods and the woods are just gorgeous it fantastic event i uh so i've never been i think it's, it's definitely on the bucket list i'm glad you got to go that's cool uh any other highlights i know ford had uh a version of the GT, which looking at the pictures, it just looks crazy. It looks amazing. Uh, what did you think of that? It looks really nice. It's the Ford Mustang G, or not Mustang, <laughs> Ford GT Mark II. And Great name. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a special high-performance track day version of the existing GT. It will not go racing. Um, it's just sort of Ford's special track day send-off to the GT now that it's winding down. Check out the pictures on our site. It looks awesome. It looks really cool. Yeah, I love the blue, gold, and white like Multimatic livery. It looks really, really sharp. Um, and there were a couple other uh, prototypes of upcoming cars that ran up the hill. Uh, the Land Rover Defender prototype went up. Um, How did that look in real life? I imagine it was camoed, but I mean... It, it looks like it does in pictures right now. It was all okay. camouflaged, so uh, there's only so much you can see. Okay. Uh, Lexus took a LC convertible prototype up the hill. And oh, that'll be cool. Yeah, they uh, confirmed that it is going into production, but they didn't say when it's happening. And uh, Soon. we did have an opportunity to talk with some Lexus people, and it sounds like it is pretty early in development. They said that there's a lot to get done, and they don't have a set date for when it's going to happen. It's just going to, it'll come out when it's ready. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. I mean, I don't think the world is necessarily going to be, you know, reject it. But, mm -hmm. I mean, if they don't get it out for a year or two, I mean, I guess that's fine. Yeah. Cool. Uh, any good food? Anything like that? What I think of Goodwood, I think of it as like the British version of Pebble, uh, Pebble Beach. Food, drinks, anything like that? Yeah. I mean, they've got all kinds of food stands. One of the things that's really fun about it is that, I mean, Pebble Beach, Monterey Motorsports Reunion, they're like really high-end events for f extremely rich people and it's mostly rich people goodwood festival of speed everybody ran the gamut there were just normal people there were ultra wealthy people everybody was kind of mixing and mingling uh there were all kinds of like food trucks to get food from it like you could tell it was kind of a fancy event but also like really casual and and everybody's welcome not really it's not too hoity-toity like it just it it's just a fun thing for everybody that likes cars to come out and enjoy. Cool. So in some ways, that's how the Woodward Dream Cruise is. It's free. Come one, come all. You see rich and famous people with their cars, and you also see just everybody with their cars. So mm -hmm. um, sounds like a very cool event. Glad you got to go. Uh, let's move on to the news of the day. Uh, speaking of high-end things, Bentley uh, showed a crazy-looking concept, the EXP100. Um this is kind of a riff on the EXP concepts they've been showing for a few years now. This thing looks amazing. I think um, it's sort of their vision for like the future, looking at like 2035, I think. Uh, this also kind of celebrates 100 years of Bentley, which is also a cool thing. Uh, 1919 to 2019, so it's a quick century for them. They did some awesome cars. Uh, you know, definitely, you know, a sign of British luxury, that's for sure. Uh, but what does this thing mean? I believe you wrote the story. Uh, what does this mean? Yeah, so it's basically Bentley's concept, goal, prediction of what its cars will be like in 2035. And, I mean, like most Bentleys, it's outrageously opulent. Um, it's made of carbon fiber and aluminum, the interior is full of wood and copper and crystal <laughs> and all kinds of fancy materials. You have a great line in here. The leather is not made from animals, but from the byproducts of winemaking. Mm -hmm. What does that even mean? <laughs> I didn't totally follow. Yeah, I, it's okay. Uh, yeah. That's. I mean, you know you have a decadent interior when the leather isn't like real leather. It's better than real leather. I don't know. 
Yeah, it, it goes. Is it it's, like uh, like reused wine skins or something? Is that what we're talking about? Or that's what I think they have something about, to do with yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Weird. And it's part of like it. It's a fully electric car. This thing is kind of themed around sustainability and being more environmentally conscious. So don't want to be killing cows that you don't have to. Mm. Methane spewing cows. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I think. Yeah, it's a. I mean, it's really forward looking. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's got lots of lights. So many lights. It's got, it's got your two main like round Bentley headlights, but the entire grill lights up, and it's a big one. Uh, it takes up like the whole front of the car. Kind of looks like cut crystal. It reminds me a little bit of that Mercedes AMG concept we saw. Yeah, a few that, years SUV, ago that like sedan SUV concept. Yeah, thing. that thing. Um, just the proportions, maybe a little bit of the silhouette. I mean. As far as just like a concept car, I love this thing. I mean, the grill, the headlights, the proportions, the curves, it's like looks long, kind of planted. The angles up front are crazy. You know, I mean, literally the headlights like kind of like boomerang at you. It's one of the biggest grills I've ever seen on an automobile. Uh, it looks like a design sketch that they they built. Now, you know, it's a concept. It's literally a concept. That's That's it, you know. But, um, man, I would love to see them take some of these design principles, put them into, you know, the next great Bentley, I think. Yeah, I, I'm sure they'll do that. Uh, one thing that I'm not a fan of, though, and I feel like every single concept seems to have to have something like this, but they talk about how it's got an artificial intelligence in it that is designed to custom tailor your experience uh, so that you're as comfortable as possible. And am I like the only person that doesn't want that i don't want i I don't want my i don't want my computer monitoring everything about me i I don't know i just think that's a little creepy (laughs) i mean basically so i was just watching random tangent here one of the final episodes of the office and dwight actually says to this crew where they're like sort of screening the office quote unquote because the joke is it was this pbs show all Mm -hmm. along anyways and dwight says to the crowd in response to a question about them having their lives on camera, he's like, well, with all the stuff going on, you're on camera far more than we ever were. And that's kind of true. Like literally I was walking my dog and this Google car went by like taking pictures of the streets for the maps. And I'm like, this is going to be so random. If when I look up like the street corner, it's going to be me and blue, the dog, like just in the picture. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of with you. I do not need that in my car don't really need it to the level it is currently in the world um obviously everything has a point though yeah i mean bentley even said that this thing can monitor your blood pressure it's like i don't need my car to know my blood pressure (laughs) i just don't need that and i don't need that to determine if i need the cabin colder or warmer or if i want the volume turned up like your blood pressure is getting a little (laughs) high there i don't know it is (laughs) Uh, to me, that's that's kind of creepy, kind of weird. Yeah, I don't know. I just... It also has its own scent. I kind of like that. That's not really yeah. new. Mercedes have that. But this makes it sound like the car has a scent. Mm-hmm. Like, again, your dog. I mean, I don't know. Cool thing, I though. Hey, hey, I mean, Bentley sells uh, scented candles. So, like, <laughs> and they have their own, like, uh, house scent for that. It's kind of like um, a little bit leathery, a little bit, you know, it's... Uh, Maybe maybe just an extension of that project. I yeah, suppose. They said that the, the specific scent for this is a combination of sandalwood and fresh moss. Which okay. actually kind of sounds all right to of me. Of course. So that makes fresh. me think of like a British kind of like bog or something. Like, you know, you're in the forest. I don't know. That's, you know, sipping maybe a whiskey. I don't know. That's That's a very Bentley scent, I guess. So... All right, I think we've hit that pretty hard. Let's talk about the Ford uh, diesel that is going away in the Transit Connect. Um, It's kind of hard to say it's going away, though, because it never actually launched. This is a report that came out uh, uh, just today. Uh, It's part of the facelifted uh, version of the Transit Connect. It's also going to lose its uh, short wheelbase version. So it doesn't sound like they sold all that many of those uh, as it is. Uh, It's just kind of an insider baseball story. I think it's interesting makes me kind of wonder about the prospects for diesel. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure people will miss it, but 
I mean, you never know. I mean, this is definitely a thing where I'm sure they study their like their business sort of customers very closely here. And obviously, maybe the take rate wasn't what they thought it would be. Yeah. I mean, the big thing for me is just it's so weird that they they announced this like a year ago and they led uh, the introduction of the new Transit Connect model with this diesel engine. Like this was the big news that was everything that they were talking about for the for the van. Everything else was kind of like a minor footnote. And now it's a gone. It's gone a year later, and I, I don't think I've ever seen one like it, because it wasn't on sale when they announced it last year. It's yeah. They they even had a brand name thought up for diesel engines, uh, Eco Blue, to kind of go with Eco Boost. That's pretty good, actually. Yeah, sounds it's not like a bad. Mercedes kind of engine, actually. Yeah, but it's just so weird that like all that thought would have gone into it. It was basically ready to go and. Then at the very, very last minute, they're just like, nah, we're not going to do it. <laughs> it's a very, it's a very curious move. Uh, I'm sure they've thought it out. Um, but it's like, to your point, it's weird to do as much of the like front end leg work and then just totally pivot. You know, I mean, it's, I think, I mean, I wonder if they ran into some technical difficulty that we don't know about, or if something in the market changed. Uh, and you know, as far as like potential take rates, that's what I, I mean. Um, I just, I don't get it. It's, it's rare. You see a car company say, Hey, we're going to do this and then not do it. Although in the case of Mazda, they actually did exactly this as far as getting the diesel out for its lineup. Uh, they finally did get it out. Uh, but I mean, literally it was like a three year running joke. Every time we'd like talk to a Mazda executive, we'd say, Hey, where's the diesel? They'd say, Hey, it's still in delay. Where's the diesel? Uh, it's still eight months away. We're not sure. And I guess they didn't actually kill it. They did stick with it. But diesel engines are tricky, it appears. And um, kind of a weird one for Ford. Yeah. yeah. And actually, oh, go ahead, uh, Jeremy. Well, okay. So a couple thoughts. Um, I think Greg, Greg's probably uh, onto something um, with the technical difficulties. Um, you know, because, you know, most car companies, when they're, when they're doing these things, um, their engineers hit their targets in internal testing. Um, and it's not until after the vehicle is released half the time that um, it goes in and gets uh, certification. Um, I think that might be changing with diesels a little bit um, with the uh, kind of regulatory um, hurdles that uh, car companies are having to jump through. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if it became harder to get past for, um, you know, EPA or, or whatever than Ford expected. And when they reran the math, they, it's possible they figured out that the market's just not big enough for this large of an investment in, um, uh, in, tech, in, in technical uh, uh, R&D and regulatory approvals. Um, also, this isn't the first time that Ford has announced something and then pulled back. Um, remember the Ford Focus Active um, when they announced that they were going to pull pull out of uh, basically everything that's not a crossover or a truck. Um, they said, "Well, we are going to bring the Focus over, but we're just going to call it the Focus Active, and we're going to put put it on stilts, kind of like the Subaru uh, Crosstrek." Um, and then shortly thereafter, they pulled back on that and said, "Oh, never mind, we're not going to do that either." Um, so yeah, uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, car companies don't really do this except Ford does this. Um, and as, as Greg said, um, Mazda had all, all kinds of trouble with their diesel. It makes me wonder if Ford had a little bit more trouble with the, the regulatory aspect of getting their diesel certified than they expected. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking that it is, it may have something to do with regulations. I'm looking at the EPA fuel economy website and the diesel isn't listed anywhere. And I mean, it could have just been that it hadn't been listed yet, but it does make me kind of think that maybe they ran into some issues and were having trouble hitting emissions targets. It also doesn't help that, uh, the diesel was supposed to get about 30 miles per gallon on the highway. Um, it was just a little 1.5 liter engine, 120 horse, uh, 200 pound feet of torque. And, I'm looking at the fuel economy here and it looks like the gas engine transit connect, uh, with the two liter gas engine is getting 29 on the highway. And 
that would probably be a hard sell to a consumer, let alone a business that the diesel only gets you one extra MPG on the highway. Um, but you're also going to be spending more on fuel because diesel is more expensive than gas. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, when you consider the, like the use case for the transit connect, it's going to have probably like a decent amount of highway usage because you know, you're hauling stuff. And then it's also got to be really good the city because that's generally why you get like the transit connect, as you say, as a pull, as opposed to the full transit, which is bigger and, you know, used for other things. So it sounds like, yeah, there were some technical difficulties and they just couldn't quite get it where it needed to be. Um, as someone who likes diesels in all sorts of uses, um, kind of sad they didn't do it, but I mean, truth be told, I highly doubt I would have ever driven one. I don't think even in the press fleets, we would have been getting one of these. So, uh, let's move along to some news out of Tesla. The, uh, Model S and Model X, will not be getting major refreshes, according to a tweet from our friend Elon Musk. Um, basically, what he said is, instead of that, they're just going to get sort of incremental gains along the way, um, which, you know, makes some sense. They're trying to do this from more of like a, a Silicon Valley, you know, developer kind of perspective, where you just continue to evolve your product along the way, as opposed to the traditional Detroit method, which is like every five years, new car, every like two and a half years, mid-cycle refresh. Maybe every, like, I don't know, year, it gets like a slight trim level tweak. He's just like making this one full, like roll down hill thing, which is interesting. I mean, that's kind of how your phone works. That's how like your operating systems work in your phone and your computer. Um, other things we know about this is those two vehicles could be getting more of a minimalist interior like that of the Model 3. I'm not so sure that's a good thing. I don't think the Model 3 has a great interior, but, uh, you know, I could see how they, they might achieve some efficiencies by, like, just thinning things out, keeping it a little more universal. Um, I know they're using some of the drive units from the Model 3 in, uh, it sounds like, the Model S. So, I mean, I get what he's doing. I mean, we tested a Model, uh, a Model S a few years ago that didn't have, you know, what was then autopilot, and they flashed it, and then it did which is really cool. So I sort of kind of like the idea that cars are just this continuous development. I mean, it might make people, especially Tesla owners, keep their cars longer. I don't know. I think that could even be anecdotal and a little theoretical. I feel like if I were going to get a Tesla, I would probably plan on keeping it for a while. It wouldn't be something like, hey, I'm going to keep this for a few years then trade it in for a five series or something. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I think in some ways this is, it's a little bit of a, um, I, I don't think you want to get lost in the message here. They're just, I think his strategy, Musk's strategy is to continually evolve his cars rather than do these like landmark refreshes. I mean, that's my takeaway from this. Yeah, totally. Um, and uh, I think you covered all the the main talking points there. Like there's, there's good reason to do that. Um, so much of the car is electronic these days that... Um, uh, and connected. Um, so updates and changes um, will just filter down. They don't, they don't have to do like a major, um, uh, you know, mid-cycle refresh to add new features um, when those features can just be enabled over the air with an update. Um, so that makes total sense. Uh, it is interesting to me too that um, Musk said via Twitter um, that, you know, not long ago, the Model S and X got more efficient. Um, there, there was a boost in range and a little bit of a boost in performance. Um, they didn't really say why that was at the time, um, but, you know, insiders knew that it was uh, a new drive unit that was of greater efficiency um, that was uh, developed for the Model 3. Um, so, yeah, why not spread that to the S and X? Um, so that's what they did. Um, so where there is a, you know, a, a, uh, an opportunity to make a hardware improvement, they're just doing it um, wherever it is in their production. They're not waiting until 2020 rolls around or, or, or what have you. Um, so what that's kind of going to be interesting is as enthusiasts and as savvy car buyers and shoppers for years, we've compared okay, well, you know, if you just get the 2019 you know, of this car, they switched from, say, a timing belt to a timing chain. 
um, if you you know if you if you wait to the uh, 2017, they added Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, and then you don't have to worry about their infotainment. That's not going to hold true with Tesla. Um, you're going to have to start getting really into the weeds on on when you're looking on the used market to find out exactly what this car um, has on it. Like, okay, it, at some point in 2018 or 19, they switched over to this new, more efficient drive unit. Um, but it's not going to be attached to a model year. Um, some 2018s, some 20, you know, 19s, whatever it is, um, would have the old one. Some would have the new one. Um, that's going to be an interesting little footnote uh, when it comes to used car shopping, I, I feel like, um, when it comes to Tesla. Uh, Musk also said via Twitter um, so that soon, once full self-driving capability is um is active and out there and working that the price uh, of a consumer facing Tesla um, bought direct is going to go up um, significantly. He said, that's an interesting talking point too. Um, I, I mean, I feel like um, Tesla has got a lot riding on this idea of full self-driving vehicles and how the cars are then therefore going to be quote unquote appreciating assets as opposed to de depreciating assets like a traditional car. Um, they're basing that on this idea that when you're not using your Tesla, if it's capable of driving itself, um, other people could, could get an app on their phone, request your car to come pick them up, drop them off, do whatever it's going to do if you don't need it. Um, and then you will then be making money on your car when you aren't driving it and using it. Um, and they've got all kinds of wild projections and how much you could actually make. Um, it sounds way too good to be true uh, for a number of reasons, they're, whether their math works out. Um, I mean, Musk is a lot smarter than I am, so I'm not, I'm not questioning his, his ability to do math. Um, but yeah, I, I have to assume it takes, into, uh, takes some, um, a, lot of, a, a lot of factors into, um, it, it kind of probably makes a lot of assumptions on what people are going to pay and, and all of that, what the car is going to be worth. Um, also, when is this full self-driving actually going to be uh, a thing? They're already selling people for several thousand dollars, the, um, the, you know, like the, the capability that's going to be enabled in the future. Um, and they're offering people to bring their cars back and get upgraded for this thing to, to, to kind of future proof them for something that isn't even active yet. It, it's, it's all so outside the traditional, um, automotive, uh, like what happens in the automotive world, um, that, you know, it's, it's just a, a really interesting talking point right now. Can't wait to see how it all plays out. Um, to see what significantly more expensive means, to see how long it takes for this full self-driving um, to, to happen, and to see if this app-based uh, robo-taxi service actually gets off the ground and starts working, and if so, when. Um, it's it's going to be a wild, wild story to follow. I mean, my prediction is that it's going to be a while before the full self-driving happens, so I would not rush out and buy a Tesla just yet. You should still have plenty of time to get it before the price jumps. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. And I think it's also, I think the idea of full self-driving is like truly farther away than people think simply because of the infrastructure. I mean, for that to really take place, I think, I mean, what are you going to do with the other like 16 million cars that are sold every year? That's just new cars that currently are not self-driving. Like you're going to have to find a way to make, you know, all of these full autonomous cars agree if you will and align with the semi and non-self-driving cars uh you're gonna have to come up with a way i mean because some people just simply won't be able to afford a self-driving car so then what do you do i think ultimately the and i mean relatively near-term solution like maybe 2025 2030 even is there's going to be like pockets of self-driving capability like whether it's like i know gm at their tech center here in uh, metro detroit they have like autonomous Chevy bolts. I think it's going to be like places, maybe even like neighborhoods, parts of cities have self-driving cars, self-driving Chevy bolts, self-driving Teslas, you know, autonomous capability like that. Although I will say this, when you do it like that, it almost becomes more like just mass transit. You know, it's just like you're mm -hmm. taking the subway. Like a bus. Yeah. Or a or, train. Or a train. <laughs> yeah. I. Part of me wonders if... 
the broad idea here may not even be the right thing. Yeah, the, the, I guess the difference on it, though, is that you're going to be using, like an Uber, you're going to be using an app um, to say, come pick me up at my house and drop me off at X, which, you know, is a little bit different than, than you know, mass transit that we have. It's, it's really more of like an Uber competitor um, or a Lyft competitor, but without the driver. Um, so, you know, you're not paying someone to actually take you. You're paying for the service of the car rendered and the owner takes the profits or Tesla takes part of the profits or something. I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I do think um, I do think it's like we're eventually going to get there, um, that the, the technology is 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 going to get to a point where we can trust it. It's probably going to be safer than your typical, you know, um, human driver. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that. But, you know, statistics are showing that it probably will be. Um, and so there's a lot of, there's a lot of good about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, this idea that you're not going to have the option of driving yourself, that they're going to take that away. Um, that's not coming anytime soon. And is every state going to regulate themselves? Is it going to be countrywide? Um, so much, so much has to happen before like this really becomes a thing. Like the altruistic like potential here though of like sick people being able to or the elderly being able to just ride in autonomous cars, that's amazing, you know, or you know, ways to take like children different places, you know. Um, you know, I could maybe save some time on my commute, like because I dropped my son off at uh at his school and it's like that's an interesting thought. He could take a you know, an autonomous Tesla if this were 10 years in the future or something. So, I mean, a lot of implications from a societal standpoint. Uh, but why don't we just stay in the present and spend some money? <laughs> Deal. Let's do that. All right. Uh, so this week, our question comes from Reddit's Our Cars thread. What should I buy? Uh, the question is, looking to buy a used car this week, deciding between the Audi S3 2016 vintage, about 20,000 miles, and the Alfa Romeo Giulia, about 15000 from 2017. So those are your two choices. Uh, look for a used car. Again, these are not very old. Luxury cars. Uh, pretty cool. Here's the criteria. And it's pretty simple. And it will, I think, uh, make this answer fairly easy, too. I know there are two different types of car. I know they are two different types of cars. But I'm looking for guidance on reliability. I want to have the car for five years. Based on your knowledge and experience, what would you recommend? Joel, we'll start with you. Say it with me, listeners. Audi S3. I mean, it, it's just, anything against an Alfa Romeo. Pick the thing that's not an Alfa Romeo if you want reliability. I'm Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> it's, it's really not when it comes down to it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very entirely logical answer. I mean... Lots of people have had issues with Alphas lately. Uh, Car and Driver had a whole thing about how their Julia Quadrifoglio was a nightmare when it came to repairs and maintenance. And, I mean, it's one thing if you're buying it brand new, nobody's ever touched it, and you've got the entire warranty ahead of you. It's another thing to buy it used with a bunch of miles already on it and questionable warranty uh, remainder. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, your thoughts? Um, well, he, assuming he's really just talking about used, buying it from a dealership or from a private owner, um, honestly, both of them kind of sound like bad ideas. Um, but if I was going to pick one of them, I would pick the Audi. Um, if he is considering looking at the certified pre-owned option that comes with some sort of extended warranty over the the time like five years if that's what he's going to have it uh, if he made sure it was covered i think you know the the alpha is a great car to drive um i totally get the appeal um uh, in in regular you know the the turbo four it's a great car um it's obviously a great car in the uh, quadrifolio but um i don't think that's what he's looking at um i get it uh but as soon as you say that reliability is one of your um one of your driving points for purchase um really you shouldn't be looking at alfa romeo at all um you know anecdotally some people probably have no problems at all with their alfa romeo uh, it'll be great and and they'll tell great stories about how it was one of the most reliable cars they've ever had but statistics don't lie and statistics currently are indicating that it's going to be one of the least reliable options out there 
um, that you're not stacking the cards in your favor. So um, Audi is the default choice there. Um, I would just say, don't limit yourself to those two options. Um, consider some other things too. Uh, if you're if you're looking at that price range, um, there's there's gonna be other things that are gonna fall into your you know an off lease BMW. Um, again, it's German, but um, you know it, it's gonna be expensive to repair. But um, predicted reliability will be better. Um, look at the Japanese Lexus offers some pretty nice cars. They've got some rear wheel drive cars even that you could uh, consider. Um, that would fall into that price range. If reliability is really one of your driving factors, um, consider that. Um, yeah, just maybe don't limit yourself to those two options if, in, unless you're, you're tied into it. But if it's one of those two, you got to go the Audi. Agreed, totally. I think, um, yeah, it's probably a good idea to broaden um, your search. I think it's also, I mean, hands down when it comes to like these two, uh, Audi is obviously going to be likely the more reliable car. I mean, it's in the most recent JD power, um, studies that came out, Audi ranked seventh, uh, Alfa Romeo was not actually on there because I believe this is like over a three year period, uh, judging like dependability. So I think, you know, frankly, some of these alphas may not even be old enough to qualify. So there's that. But, uh, I mean, Audi was a solid seventh, uh, as far, pro as far as like problems detected, uh, ahead of a lot of major brands, uh, not all that far from like, you know, being in the top five. So, I mean, is an Audi the most reliable car you could buy and a used Audi is you know, still a bit of a question mark? Absolutely. But if you're going to face it off against the Julia and Alfa Romeo, I mean, yeah, slam dunk. The Audi's going to come out ahead. Uh, I do have a soft spot for the Julia. I think it's a brilliant car to drive. I think it's gorgeous. I think, um, it really, in a lot of ways, does achieve what Alfa Romeo is trying to do in its return to the United States. Uh, I would probably consider it more as far as just me personally, because I like it so much and I think I enjoy driving it so much. Um, but putting that emotion aside and it has an awful infotainment system, that's another thing you got to mm. remember. The S3 is a solid car. It wins in so many different areas. That two liter uh, engine is really good. It has a good chassis. Uh, I fondly remember driving one on the streets of Monaco a few years back and, um, it, it's a brilliant car. I mean, it just, it does so many things well. Uh, so yeah, I mean, pretty simply S3 for me and I think S3 across the board, that's three for the S3. Yeah. yeah. It, it is real small though, right? Like that back seats, uh, it is very small. Yeah. Yep. Cause very the S3, small. it's the S3 is basically a golf R yeah. is what it is. Um, which, which is not a bad thing. Good and bad, yeah. I mean, um, small, but yeah. The the one thing that disappoints me with the S3 is, well, and the whole Audi A3 line is that the interior is not very nice besides mm -hmm. being kind of cramped. Um, and actually, for all these reasons, something that I just wanted to throw out as a possible option, I think possibly a Mazda 3 or a Mazda 6 would be a nice option in this group for kind of reliable nice interiors classy looks and still being really good to drive also you could probably get a new one uh versus i mean he's looking at a very recent vintage uh of these used cars so i mean mm -hmm. you could probably get a new mazda 3 for somewhat in the same ballpark yeah, yeah with, without looking into... i'm not sure where it would fall but what about a kia stinger um would that fall into that similar price range be very nice good driving dynamics and it doesn't have the premium badge on it but it's nice I think you could maybe get the four cylinder used in kind of that range. Mm. And that would be a very nice car. <laughs> that being said, it sounds like, uh, this, uh, this writer is going for like, you know, the luxury look, you know, I think in some ways we're doing a little, like what we always do, which is like, consider these other things that we would consider. <laughs> and it's like, I think when you're like a car buyer, you're just like, I want this luxury car. You know? Yeah. So, and it kind of sounds it like is. he's, yeah. And it kind of sounds like he's looking at two specific ones. Yes. Because this is a specific year and a specific number of miles. Yeah. Now, when you're basing it on reliability, I mean, if that's your, those are your parameters, that's the lens uh, that you're looking through this. I mean, that's, you know, you do kind of have to go with the Audi. If he's like, hey, I know this is going to be kind of a, a mechanical potential nightmare. You know, I could be doing all these repairs. Uh, you know, Alpha hasn't been back here that long, so we don't really know how well these new Alphas are going to hold up. Like, if he were to sort of quantify the question that way, 
maybe we do come down on the side of the alpha, but just based on these constraints, reliability, yeah, the S3 is going to probably be better. Right. The other thing yeah. to keep in mind is that um, Audi has a much bigger dealer network than Indeed. Alpha. So if something does go wrong, you don't have to go way out of your way to find a dealer. Yeah. You got to go to a Fiat dealer for the Alpha. Um, I don't know if Jeep or Fiat Chrysler like would service an Alpha. They might, but I mean, they also might not. And yeah. for what it's worth, Fiat ranked dead last in the same JD Power study I was referencing. So Alpha may be entirely different, but I can't imagine they're going to rank like if Audi's seventh, I don't think Alpha would be eighth once they get, you know, sort of quantified, you know, the requisite number of years. But uh, that's all the time we have this week. It's been fun, guys. Uh, another great episode of the Autoblog podcast. Be sure to check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, be safe out there, and we will see you next week. Hey everybody, this is podcast producer Eric Meyer here. I just wanted to chime in at the end of the episode and let everybody know that Autoblog has merchandise now. Um, we've got t-shirts, coffee mugs, hoodies, throw pillows, you name it. You can find it all at redbubble.com slash people slash autoblog, or you can just search autoblog on redbubble.com. As always, thanks for listening to the show, and we'll see you next week.